In 1975, in the Enzyme, President Benson summed up the purpose and the mission of the Book of Mormon so simply that anyone can understand. And this is what he said. He said, quote, is the Book of Mormon true? Yes. Who is it for? Us. What is its purpose? To bring men to Christ. But how does it do this? By testifying of Christ and revealing his enemies, end quote. Isn't that interesting? President Benson emphasizes that it's not just talking about Jesus Christ and testifying of him that is enough to bring us to Christ, but we need to recognize, detect, and reveal his enemies. And the Book of Mormon is the best tool to do that. Today, meet Sharon. He's basically the first antichrist in the Book of Mormon. And as we investigate Sharon, specifically from a prophetic parallel perspective, as we look at Sharon and say, what does he parallel with in our day based on the four hour day timeline and model? We are going to see astonishing correlations with apostate Christianity, with the false creeds during the Dark Ages, and the impact that those creeds still have today. So let's go ahead and let's dive in. Sherem comes among the Nephites with a very clever platform, presenting his antichrist theories as actually completely in harmony with the scriptures. But if you were to sum up his case, it was essentially that there would be no Christ. In other words, there was a God, yes, but there would be no son of God, no Jesus Christ with a mission and a role that is central in the gospel. That there was no current ongoing revelation, no Holy Ghost with spiritual gifts, and it was blasphemy if you claimed that you could know the future. Sherem had a heavy focus on hollow form and the rituals of the law of Moses, but he was missing the spirit of the gospel. Now, if you think about Sherem and the time period that he comes about, this is after the time period of Lehi, but it's still in those early chapters of the Book of Mormon. We're still in the midst of the founding of the Nephite nation. So if you now go to our day, to the Latter-day Signs of the Times, and you think about those early signs of the times, of course, we're past the Reformation, we're past the colonization of America, but we're still in that founding period. What do we see? Well, we actually see the exact same beliefs or similar uh, underlying parallel beliefs among many of those who professed to be Christians. In Joseph Smith's own account, Joseph Smith history that's in our scriptures, he records this account of a conversation he had with a minister following the first vision. I'm sure you've heard this account, but notice the details of why this minister did not want to accept Joseph Smith's account of the first vision. Quote, some few days after I had this vision, the first vision, I happened to be in company with one of the Methodist preachers who was very active in the before-mentioned religious excitement, right? This is the religious revival and the excitement that was going on in the early 1800s. Joseph Smith says, In conversing with him on the subject of religion, I took occasion to give him an account of the vision which I had had. I was greatly surprised at his behavior. He treated my communication not only lightly, but with great contempt, saying, It was all of the devil that there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days, that all such things had ceased with the apostles, and that there would never be any more of them, end quote. Now, it is important to recognize that not necessarily everyone in Joseph Smith's time period said that you couldn't have visions, you couldn't have dreams. In fact, it's interesting, if you look at the early 1800s, there were a lot of Individuals who were experiencing spiritual gifts, most of them were probably counterfeits from the devil. This is the same time period when you have the rise of spiritualism, um, which is basically the occult and um, dabbling in Satanism. Um, but at the same time, you have this skepticism and this perspective that, you know what, the early apostles in the Book of Mormon, yeah, they had speaking in tongues. Yes, they had the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, they had um, these different gifts of prophecy and revelation. But now we're so advanced. We live in this glorious blaze of gospel light. And 
That's unnecessary. We don't need the same spiritual gifts that they had in the days of the early apostles, like recorded in the book of Acts. And a lot of this was stemming from a false understanding of God's nature and who he is and even the entire plan of salvation. And it all goes back to these creeds that were adopted during the Dark Ages, during the Great Apostasy. And we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. But first, let's just pause for a minute and, and let's go back to Sharem. And let's really understand first and get a foundation in why, what was the motivation behind Sharem's desire to deny these spiritual experiences? And the same in Joseph Smith's day, what, what's going on here? So as Jacob and Sharon begin confronting one another and having this uh, debate of sorts, Sharon tells Jacob, quote, show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost in the which ye know so much, end quote, right? Jacob is telling Sharon, Sharon, you do not understand the gospel. You're twisting the scriptures. I have had experiences. I have talked with God and I can tell you, I know who God is. You do not know God. You have not spoken with God. And he's trying to clarify Sherem's false antichrist teachings. And Sherem responds, prove it to me. Show me a sign. Now, there are some very fascinating teachings from Joseph Smith about sign seeking that is very critical to understand because I think it is one of the key issues and uh, principles that we need to understand in our day to avoid deception. Joseph Smith taught in 1839, he said, quote, Jesus put forth in saying that he who seeketh a sign is an adulterous person, and that principle is eternal, undeviating, and firm as the pillars of heaven. For whenever you see a man seeking after a sign, you may set it down that he is an adulterous person, end quote. So here, Joseph Smith is actually connecting sign seeking as a, a physical symptom of what's going on actually in the person's heart. And he says that it is a firm, undeviating principle that adultery, that sexual immorality is actually connected with sign seeking. Joseph Smith taught this again on another occasion when he said, quote, when I was preaching in Philadelphia, a Quaker called out for a sign. I told him to be still. After the sermon, he again asked for a sign. I told the congregation the man was an adulterer, that a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and that the Lord had said to me in a revelation that any man who wanted a sign was an adulterous person. It is true, cried one. For I caught him in the very act, which the man afterwards confessed when he was baptized, end quote. There are so many reasons we could talk about to understand why sign seeking is connected with the sin of immorality, why um, the if a person is struggling with that sin, what it's really revealing about them and the uh, approach that they have to the gospel, the connection they have to God, the way they see God, the way they see spiritual experiences, how that all falls out from that. Um, but for the purpose of this lesson, you, you can think about that on your, on your own time, but the, for the purpose of this lesson, it's important to remember that sin sets us up to be deceived. And morality is so critical. You know, in our last lesson, we talked about virtue and chastity and how really it is a critical, critical issue in our time. And it is setting us up for deception. Uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 10, the Lord says that the reason so many people are blinded, why they cannot accept the truth, why they just can't see it, they can't get it, is because, quote, they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, end quote. Nephi talks more about this himself when he says, quote, Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner false and vain and foolish doctrines. This is our day, right? Nephi is speaking to us. And he says, and shall be puffed up in their hearts and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord. And their works shall be in the dark. Yea, they have all gone out of the way. They have become corrupted, end quote. So here we see this connection between false doctrine and sin. They are connected. And we see in our day that Satan knows this strategy very well. What did he do? You know, Joseph Smith comes about uh, with the restoration of the gospel. And the same time Joseph Smith does that, all of these other 
thinkers and influencers show up. You have Karl Marx and Charles Darwin and Sigmund Freud and John Maynard Keynes, all of these men that presidents of the church have identified as antichrist in our day. These are documented quotes. So they come about at the same time, funny enough, as Joseph Smith. But it's fine that they show up and start teaching their false philosophies, but how is Satan going to get us? How is he going to get the covenant people to adopt those false ideologies? He does it by getting us to compromise on our standards and to sin, and it works. It is working brilliantly in our day. And as, as a people, as we have compromised our standards, our standards of music, dress, language, health, our morality, our deception at the same time has increased. And this is what we see with the story of Sherem. It's what we see in the teachings of the scriptures. Uh, the Lord tells Joseph Smith this in Joseph Smith history when he says, they draw near unto me with their lips, right? You can claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can claim to be Christian. You can claim to be religious. You can go to church every Sunday. But the real question is, as the Lord points out, he says, they're drawing near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men. This was Sherem's problem. He's coming on the scene and he's saying, I'm teaching the scriptures. I'm, I'm encouraging people to keep the law of Moses. I'm promoting God. And yet he is teaching philosophies and ideas that are completely the opposite of the gospel. The Lord says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So this is key. Remember Sherem. Sherem denied that you could know of things to come. He denied spiritual gifts. He denied the power of the Holy Ghost. And this is a pattern that we see in our day, not only in Joseph Smith's day, but also today. Elder Bednar made this comment in May 2006 in the Enzyme when he said, quote, Sometimes as Latter-day Saints, we talk and act as though recognizing the influence of the Holy Ghost in our lives is the rare or exceptional event. We should remember, however, that the covenant promise, this is the baptismal covenant, right, is that we may always have his spirit to be with us, end quote. There's an excellent scene in one of the seminary videos produced by the church in the 90s and early 2000s about the story of how Wilford Woodruff comes into the church. And there is a scene where Wilford Woodruff, before he's introduced to the Book of Mormon, before he meets the missionaries, he's overhearing this debate or conversation with these ministers. And, and this one minister says, you know, the, the spiritual gifts of our day are unnecessary. We live in this glorious blaze of gospel light. Um, the manifestations that were in the past are unnecessary today. Moses said he talked with God face to face, but you teach that God is a spirit. Why do you not preach the doctrine of baptism as Jesus Christ did? Young man, we live today in a glorious blaze of gospel light. Such doctrine is unnecessary. Excuse me. And what else? Is that? Unnecessary. So the Lord himself was baptized. Everyone seems to have their own system of spiritualizing the scriptures to make them bend to their own views. Where is the truth? Why is there so much confusion? Now, of course, that is something that, as Latter-day Saints, uh, was shattered with Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith talks to God the Father. He talks to Jesus Christ. He talks to Moses and to all of these ancient prophets. But at the same time, we need to make sure we don't lose sight of what Elder Bednar was saying, that every single one of us is supposed to have the Holy Ghost always with us, that revelation is supposed to be a key part of our lives. And this doesn't mean warm fuzzies um, that just guide us subtly. The Lord wants to reveal God to us so we can actually know how to be saved. I had a very interesting experience years ago. I went to a presentation in Bluffdale, Utah, where there was a Christian who had been pers heavily persecuted and imprisoned in China for printing Bibles. He eventually escaped, and he and his daughter were visiting, um, just doing some different speaking engagements in Utah and Bluffdale. After he got done speaking, I, I was there with my siblings, and it was actually kind of sad. It was at an evangelical church in Utah. And yet, as I looked over the audience, there was not a single member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints there. Um, I felt kind of disappointed and kind of sad about that, but that was okay. My siblings and I were the only um, Mormons there, Latter-day Saints there. Um, but after this uh, Chinese Christian got done speaking, uh, 
someone else was getting up ready to speak and my siblings and I were in the hall and we saw this man kind of over by himself and we thought, whoa, this is a once in a lifetime probably opportunity. He's just sitting there for the next hour. Let's go talk to him. So we were able to have a one-on-one conversation with this man, just just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And we found out that he was personal friends with Brother Yoon and all of us had read Brother Yoon's autobiography, The Heavenly Man. We loved it. And so it was really fun. We found a lot of common ground. And, and during the conversation, I asked him a question because I was just young at the time. And I remember I had read a lot of books from different Christians who had been persecuted in communist Romania, in Russia, in China. And there was a common theme in so many of these books where these incredibly faithful men and women would say that they had such powerful experiences where they were close to God in prison that some of them didn't want to leave their homeland of persecution because God was with them. It was hard. It was brutally hard. Uh, but they had so much to be grateful for. And so I asked him, if you had the choice that you could go back, would you rather go back to China and work among your people or would you rather stay here? Now you're here in the United States, prosperity, complete ease and comfort compared to what he had before. And it was very interesting because he said, oh, I would go back. And I said, why? And he said, well, he said, you don't understand that the spiritual experiences and the power that is present when we worship together in our churches, in our meetings is incredible. And I come came to the United States and it's just kind of dead. And then he quickly followed that up by saying, oh, but I've talked to like my brothers and sisters here and they've explained to me, you know, in, in China, we're, you know, just a young church. And so God has to give us those spiritual experiences to help us get established and help comfort us. And and you guys here are just, you know, so much more grounded and you've been here so much longer. You, you don't need that anymore. So he, he's like, I'm not downplaying you guys, but I really miss it. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you don't need to (laughs) apologize to me and explain why spiritual gifts are unnecessary. Um, But that really stuck out to me that I never forgot it. That here you had a man who was persecuted. We're talking about um, he was tortured with electric batons. Um, just, Just horrific things had happened to him and to those that he loved. And yet, The gifts of the spirit and the gift of feeling close to the Lord and feeling revelation was so beautiful and brought so much joy that he would rather, if he had the choice between suffering, being tortured and having those gifts of the spirit versus living in peace and comfort, but not having those gifts of the spirit, he would rather have the torture. It just really stuck in my mind and made me start wondering, wait a minute, why are we so quick to deny spiritual gifts in our day. Where are the spiritual gifts of even the early pioneers in our day? If you read the accounts of Eliza R. Snow or so many of these amazing men and women, our pioneer forefathers and foremothers, speaking in tongues, visions, the ministration of angels, both for men and women, it was a very a frequent occurrence. It was very real, having dreams, visions, prophesying. Um, it, it was frequent. Whereas today, that has definitely diminished. Why? Well, part of that goes back to the same attitude of Sherem. Sherem, an antichrist that the Book of Mormon is trying to expose in our day, denying that those spiritual gifts happen, saying they're unnecessary, and that you can't know what is to come. In our own day, we see a similar um, vibe of progressive skepticism trying to seep its way into the church and to sensitize us to where we also, as a people, I fear sometimes maybe going down a road of also denying spiritual gifts. So when we wrote our book, Faith Crisis 2, Behind Closed Doors, which was really a response to this new narrative, this new progressive narrative of church history that is being promoted, the idea that Joseph Smith was involved in folk magic and treasure digging, that he made mistakes 
in his practice of plural marriage, that he injured Emma, that he um, didn't know what he was doing, basically. It was a bumbling buffoon trying to figure out doctrine, was borrowing things, sometimes was inspired, sometimes not. It's this new progressive narrative that's being promoted by individuals who are members of the church to our young people, to older people and biographies such as Rough Stone Rolling. And, and a lot of it goes back to this movement of new Mormon history. And Leonard Arrington was the father of that movement. And so we wrote a book going through his diaries and, and letters and, and what the motivation was behind this movement, why they wanted to change the history. And one of the things that we found is that a key element of the progressive history is that it is primarily being written by men who really deny miracles and spiritual experiences or just they don't understand personally at all what they are. So when you come to the situation of Leonard Arrington, for example, he's trying to interpret Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. He's trying to write about our church history. And yet in his personal life, and we have this all documented from Leonard Arrington's own words, his own diaries, um, he was an individual who read the Book of Mormon through once when he was 13 and never read through it all the way through again. Um, he didn't see value in reading the scriptures. Um, he made a statement where he said it didn't really matter, you know, whether the first vision literally occurred or whether the golden plates, the, the Nephite golden plates actually existed or whether it's just part of this quote unquote myth that's in our church history. Um, he prided himself that when he was on the high council and in a state presidency, that his talks were all history focused and not religious or spiritual. He was actually proud of that. Um, he, he made comments where he said, you know, just I don't see going to the temple. I don't see that as necessary. Um, the Bible isn't really historical. Moses didn't really write the first five books of Moses. And when he put together his team of historians, when he was called as the church historian before his department was closed down by leaders of the church, um, he specifically was advised and agreed that he didn't want any holy ghosters on his um, committee or working for him. What do you mean by a Holy Ghoster? Meaning someone who believed, you know, uh, the Holy Ghost testifies to me of truth. And it's truth that I know without a shadow of a doubt. And he said, you know, this idea that you can have a feeling of certitude. And he actually specifically named individuals such as Joseph Fielding Smith, David O. McKay, Hiram Andrus, that they were Holy Ghosters and that they believed that they could have this revelation from God, that they could know truth without a shadow of doubt. And he said, Nope, those are not the people that I want helping write the history. So he was looking for individuals who didn't have that testimony of revelation. And you can see this in his writings. You know, he talks about, you know, Charles Darwin and Joseph Smith, their contributions, they're kind of on equal equal playing field here. They, they both had uh, bouts of inspiration and they're just similar to each other. Um, in other words, he was trying to interpret Joseph Smith without being able to understand who Joseph Smith really was. There is a story that's told by his son, James Arrington, of the first time that Leonard gave a testimony in a general conference. And he came to his son, James, who was an actor and said, you know, I don't know how to do this. Like people want to feel like I know something and I don't. <laughs> and and so he had his son, who was an actor, coach him through it and say, OK, dad, you know, here's what you're going to do. And, and we're going to have you like take off your glasses and lean into the pulpit, you know, and so they can just like have that feeling like that you're being transparent. And in, in other words, it was rehearsed. The testimony was rehearsed. And because uh, this is not to, you know, bash on Leonard Arrington. It's just he didn't have experience in spiritual things. And so it's no accident. It's no wonder that he clashed head on with President Ezra Taft Benson, who was president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles um, for a significant time when Leonard Arrington was up there working at church headquarters. And they clashed, you know, it was this showdown between these two boys from Idaho because you have President Benson, someone who definitely knew what the spirit of prophecy and revelation was for himself. He had experienced it many, many times throughout his life. And so he has a perspective and he has a worldview 
and Leonard Arrington is coming from a different worldview. And President Benson expressed this concern that you cannot understand our history, you cannot understand Joseph Smith unless you live like him. President Benson said, quote, no writer can ever accurately portray a prophet of God if he or she does not believe in prophecy. They cannot succeed in writing what they do not have in personal faith, end quote. President Benson made that comment in 1977 speaking at BYU. And during a period of actual controversy between Leonard Arrington and some of his staff, President Benson also made another comment where he said, we must never forget that ours is a prophetic history. Our students need to understand this prophetic history. This can only be done by teachers who themselves possess the spirit of prophecy and revelation, end quote. This is probably one of the key uh, divisions and differences between progressive church history and traditionalist church history. The one says you cannot understand God unless you're in tune with him. You, you have it revealed. You can't understand Joseph Smith. You can't understand what it is to be a prophet unless you have yourself experienced revelation or prophecy. And on the other hand, approaching Joseph Smith from a secular point of view, from just trying to understand him without God in the picture, from the words of President Benson and other leaders of the church, they say that's impossible. You just cannot do it. Um, President Packer made a comment where he said, quote, there is no such thing as an accurate or objective history of the church which ignores the spirit. You might as well try to write the biography of Mendelssohn without hearing or mentioning this music or write the life of Rembrandt without mentioning light or canvas or color. If someone who knew very little about music should write a biography of Mendelssohn, one who had been trained to have a feeling for music would recognize that very quickly. That reader would not be many pages into the manuscript before he would know that a most essential ingredient had been left out. If we who research, write, and teach the history of the church ignore the spiritual on the pretext that the world may not understand it, our work will not be objective. And if, for the same reason, we keep it quite secular— we will produce a history that is not accurate and not scholarly. This in spite of the extent of research or the nature of the individual statements or the incidents which are included as part of it. And notwithstanding the training or scholarly reputation of the one who writes or teaches it, we would end up with a history with the one most essential ingredient left out." End quote. So now let's come back to Sharon, right? Sharon was trying to approach the law of Moses, the law of God, the faith of the Nephites without experiencing any of it for himself. He had not talked to God. He didn't believe that God could talk to him. And at the same time, he was trying to interpret the scriptures. He comes to Jacob and he says, yeah, I believe the scriptures. And Jacob says, um, you don't understand the scriptures. You can read them, but you do not understand them. It is the same. We're facing the same ideology in our day when we try to say, oh, we, we can understand Joseph Smith. We can study church history from individuals who deny the very spiritual experiences or have not experienced the spiritual experiences that these prophets of God have that they're trying to write about. You, you cannot understand salt if you've never tasted it. You can't describe snow if you've never seen snow before. You have to know the field. And when you come to Jacob, this is exactly why Jacob was able to contend with Sherem and why when so many other Nephites were being completely duped by this Antichrist, the minute Jacob heard it, he said, no way. He wasn't fooled for an instant. Jacob says in chapter 7, verse 5, he said, quote, Sherem had hoped to shake me from the faith. And notwithstanding the many revelations and the many things which I had seen concerning these things, for I had truly seen angels and they had ministered unto me. And also I had heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word from time to time, wherefore I could not be shaken, End quote. Now at the beginning of this lesson, I mentioned 
Jacob could see through Sherem's lies because he had personally experienced the opposite. He knew who God really was. He had spoken with Jesus Christ, as we learn in 2 Nephi 2. So it didn't matter who came along. It didn't matter how um, compelling Sharon was or her flattering or how well-skilled he was in the language. Jacob could not be shaken. Now you'll notice that Satan has had an agenda to destroy this ability to become unshaken in the faith from the very beginning. You know, at the beginning of this lesson, I mentioned how Sharon is really a parallel with the apostate Christianity and creeds that crept in during the great apostasy and were definitely in full force during Joseph Smith's day and we're still bearing the consequences of those creeds today. Uh, John Wesley was the founder really of the Methodist church. He lived before the time period of Joseph Smith, so he wasn't able to experience the restoration, uh, but he actually wrote several times about how he could tell that Christianity had been corrupted and he was looking for a restoration and for a return of the things that he saw in the Bible. And he made this statement specifically about gifts of the Holy Ghost and how these were attacked during the early stages of Christianity. We're talking in the early century AD period. Um, he said, quote, It does not appear that these extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were common in the church for more than two or three centuries. We seldom hear of them after that fatal period when the Emperor Constantine called himself a Christian. Don't forget Constantine. Constantine is very key and we're going to talk about him in a minute. From this time, they almost totally ceased. The Christians had no more of the Spirit of Christ than the other heathens. This was the real cause why the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were no longer to be found in the Christian church because the Christians were turned heathens again and had only a dead form left, end quote. You can see here that John Wesley, without Joseph Smith, without the Book of Mormon, without knowing about the restoration of the gospel, he could tell. He says, well, wait a minute, the Christianity we have today is different than existed in the past and we've forsaken our moorings. And he was one of those amazing reformers who really laid the stepping stones that prepared the way for Joseph Smith to come and do his work. Uh, the kind of culmination of John Wesley's story, of course, is in 1877 when President Wilford Woodruff was in the St. George Temple and John Wesley, along with other men, come and ask for their temple work to be done. And they plead. They say, we are the ones that laid the foundation so you even could have these temples. Please do our work for us. And John Wesley was ordained a high priest at that time. Now, it's important as we're having this conversation about the importance of spiritual gifts and revelation that we just take a moment to remind ourselves that there is a difference between sign seeking for spiritual gifts and actually having revelation like Jacob did and Nephi and so many righteous prophets of God. The one comes from men and women who struggle with sin, who do not want to become clean, but they're seeking after these, oh, spiritual manifestations because it's almost as if we tell ourselves, you know, if I have these dreams and these visions and spirits come to me, then all of a sudden I'm a good person and I'm accepted of God and I don't have to repent. I don't have to forgive. I don't have to live clean. I can watch whatever I want um, and I can have the spirit of God too. And the problem with that is, Oh, you'll have spiritual experiences. You pray for that? Oh, they'll come, but they won't come from God. There's a statement from President Wilford Woodruff where he said that he never in his life once prayed for an angel to come or a manifestation like that. He said, I just keep the commandments. I do the work. And yes, God speaks with me. Yes. But my foundation, my drive, my motivation is on the work. It's on keeping the commandments. We live today in the 21st century. I see this everywhere where there are hundreds and hundreds of men and women, members of the church, many of them, who profess to have spiritual experiences, who claim that Jesus Christ is coming to them or they're having this or that revelation. And the vast majority that I have personally seen 
are frauds and they are fakes. And I can say that because you can test their experiences against scripture and they are found wanting. Um, they fall through. I would submit that a major reason of this is because as a people, we are not living as clean as we are supposed to be. This goes back to Sherem. This goes back to Joseph Smith's teachings. People that seek after experiences for the sake of the experiences, right? They're, they're driven by this physical experience that they want to have. The same way people that struggle with immorality, whether it's pornography or adultery or fornication, they're driven by lust. It's driven by a physical appetite. There is a side of labeling, oh, you know, like I, I'm seeking to know God and I'm seeking to know the scriptures, but it's really underneath. It's just a drive to satisfy a physical appetite. President Joseph F. Smith commented on this when he said, quote, show me Latter-day Saints who have to feed upon miracles, signs, and visions in order to keep them steadfast in the church. And I will show you members of the church who are not in good standing before God and who are walking in slippery paths. It is not by marvelous manifestations unto us that we shall be established in the truth. It is by humility and faithful obedience to the commandments and laws of God, end quote. Elder Bruce McConkie made a similar comment when he said, quote, signs flow from faith. They may incidentally have the effect of strengthening the faith of those who are already spiritually inclined, but their chief purpose is not to convert people to the truth, right? For Sharon, show me a sign. The sign converts me. The dream converts me. The vision converts me. The gift of healing or prophecy converts me. No, that is not how it works. He says their chief purpose is not to convert people to the truth, but to reward and bless those already converted. Signs are sacred grants of divine favor reserved for the faithful and concerning which the recipients are commanded not to boast, end quote. This is really key. There's a beautiful statement from Joseph Smith where Joseph Smith taught that the gifts of the spirit are like the food and drink for weary travelers who are traveling on the road of trying to live the gospel. The gospel is about faith, repentance, laying down your life, sacrifice. That's the gospel. And as you're continuing on that path, there are times when you need encouragement and you need comfort. And God will speak to you. He will help you understand who he is and he will give you comfort and inspiration, prophecy, but that is not your foundation. So this is just really key because we're living in an age where there are so many people who are looking back and they're saying, I want the spiritual gifts of the early pioneers and, you know, the, in the new Testament and these prophets of God, but not recognizing that you've got to be very, very, very careful, <laughs> I have personally in my life seen so many friends, good people who were seeking to build Zion. They're seeking down this road, but instead of doing it the right way, they quickly fell into deceptive spiritual experiences um, and a lot of them went back to sin. So we've got to keep that focus, repentance, living the gospel and what the gospel really is. And at the same time, recognizing that, yes, the spiritual gifts are necessary. They are important. And I know that for myself. I do not want anyone to walk away from this podcast thinking, oh, Hannah Stoddard is saying the spiritual gifts are not necessary or no, I'm just urging extreme caution. I know the spiritual gifts are real. I know that for myself and they are essential and they are critical. Jacob is able to detect Sharon because he's talked with God. That's not just um, a extra perk of the gospel. It is essential. Life eternal is to know God and you only know what you've experienced. But there is another lowercase God of this world or a man who claims to be the God of this world who is so clever and so crafty in transforming himself into an angel of light and he is speaking just as much or more than God is in our day. So it is so critical, something that we really need to be careful of and be wary of and continually seek humility like President Joseph F. Smith, keeping the commandments, living clean, being faithfully obedient and purging any sin out of our lives. So now we're finally ready to talk about the creeds. 